Um, so I was asked to um, go over um, tex immunotherapy-related toxicities. And um, I think what I was going to structure my talk um, around is first um, go over the toxicities that we see with immunotherapy and then concentrate uh, second half of the talk on how do you manage those toxicities. There are there any certain clinical pearls that you need to be aware of when you treat those patients with immunotherapies? So the good news is that most likely if you have not yet given an immunotherapy to a patient, you're probably going to be giving immunotherapy to a patient very soon. So I put in here the currently approved immunotherapy for different malignancies and put there the classes of immunotherapy approved. And on the right uh, column, it's a back of the napkin cal calculators, calculations based on the U.S. incidence of the malignancy and also based on what line of therapy, on what indication the immunotherapy is approved. And so currently in the United States, there should be about 160,000 patients per year who are eligible in one way or another for immunotherapy treatments. It is also interesting that we have some upcoming pedialomas, uh, so the, the conditions where they're more likely to eventually um, respond to immunotherapy because the preliminary data looks very promising. So as an oncologist, I think it's very important for us to get familiar with those drugs because they are here to stay, and as we're going to be using more and more combinations, the toxicities might be more pronounced, and as an oncologist, you do need to uh, be very familiar as to what to do with those toxicities. So um, as we already heard today, um, their immunotherapy is not chemotherapy. It works differently, and because it works differently, we expect toxicities to be different. We do not expect mild suppression, we do not expect nausea, but we do expect uh, more of the autoimmune uh, predisposition, and this is because uh, checkpoint inhibitors result in T cell activation, and those activated T cell tip the balance of the immunity towards autoimmunities, causing something that we call immune-related adverse event. The immune-related adverse events has a certain characteristic. So they are reversible if treated promptly. If left untreated, they get worse. And if you delay the treatment, for example, if you have a patient with grade two toxicity and for some reason you decide not to start therapy right away, not only that toxicity will increase in severity, but it's also going to take it longer for you to bring it back under control. On the right hand of the slide, I showed um, a human picture just to point out that anything can happen. So any organ can be affected, and the average onset of the immune-related toxicity usually about 6 to 12 weeks after initiation of therapy, but... It can also happen within days of um, starting therapy. You've probably all read the New England Journal of Medicine um, cardiac toxicity uh, case reports, and both of them started before the second week of therapy, so day 12, and I think the second case was also very, uh, very soon. It can also happen after several months of therapy, and the most important thing that we forget, it can also happen after you discontinue therapy. So if your patient has progressed in immunotherapy and you stopped it, do not lower your, um, your thinking, it's just because those patients can still develop um, immune-related um, toxicities even though they have stopped immune-related uh, drugs. So this is an example of, uh, so when you, when you see the patient in clinic, you know, patients present to us and they have symptoms. In order for you to evaluate the patient effectively, you kind of have to know when to expect what. Um, so we, this is an example of uh, new volume app data um, looking at when the immune-related toxicity happened, when the first event of immune toxicity happened. So you can see that A, majority of them happens within the first three months. So the months zero to three, you expect skin toxicity, you will expect gastrointestinal toxicity, pulmonary toxicity. But if you look at the right side of the graph where the months 12 to 24, you can see that your patients are unlikely to develop new toxicity at that point. It can still happen, but usually if they've gone well for the first 12 months, it is unlikely for them to develop something they haven't had already. 
Um, kind of going into the topic of combination therapy, uh, this is melanoma data, um, very famous slide, people are keep putting it in the, in the talks, looking at the kinetics of adverse events with CTLA-4 antibody um, in the patients with melanoma, and very similar idea. You can see that rash usually comes first, then the diarrhea comes second, and something that's later in those toxicities are uh, liver toxicity and hyperphysitis. Uh, this is an, another example of comparison between CTLA 4s PD1 and PDL1. When we just started looking at PD1 therapy, PDL1 therapy, we thought that maybe the toxicity profiles of those compounds would be different, but it actually does not appear to be the case. Um, so you can see the big differences between CTLA 4 and PD1s and PDL ones. The CTLA 4 as a group causes more grade one to two immune-related toxicities, and there is not much difference between uh, PDL um, and PDL ones. There is another um, data that, oh, this is, um, actually, let me go and see if I can skip that. So there is another meta-analysis that was just presented at um, ASCA looking at 4,000 patients and comparing immune-related adverse events between PD-1 inhibitors and PDL one inhibitors, and the, the, the Summary of that was that there is no difference. And the only thing that's also important here that you can see that for the PD-1 inhibition, the immune-related adverse events are not that frequent. And if you look here, the all immune-related adverse events were about 11 to 7 percent. Going back to what I was going to show you, um, I put there in a table um, the currently approved immunotherapy for lung cancer going from uh, first line for Pembra, second line Pembra, nivolumab, and Ateza. And you can see that, again, immune-related adverse events, they're there, but they're not as frequent. And if you look at overall, it's about, again, looking at the different literature, anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of patients will develop immune-related adverse events. But you can see that the grade three toxicities are actually in a single digit percent. You have to be aware of them, because if your patient develops a grade three colitis, that could be potentially life-threatening colitis. But the good news is that the PD-1 and PDL one therapies are well tolerated in majority of our patients. So how do you start immunotherapy? And I think um, it is very important to do um, a lot of education. I think as a physician, we are very well versed in uh, what to expect and what ask the patients, but I think it is also important to educate our mid-level providers and our infusion therapy nurses and our nurses that um, see patients with us in clinic. So when we start immunotherapy, I have to have some idea. Am I going to have a problematic patient who is going to have a lot of toxicity, or I'm going to have a patient who is going to have less toxicity? And what we know that in uh, the previous history of autoimmunity increases the risk of the patient developing um, immune-related toxicity, and I'll show you the data later. So when you evaluate the patient, you're about to start immunotherapy, I think it's important to figure out and ask the patient, have you ever had any kind of autoimmune conditions? And I think here also we now learning that it's both personal history as well as family history. Both of them are important. And you have to remember some less common autoimmune conditions like psoriasis, diabetes, sarcoidosis, and others. So do I, am I going to prescribe, the, for example, if I see the patient and say, yeah, I do have rheumatoid arthritis. So is that an absolute showstopper for me? Is it something that I will not be able to prescribe an immune-related um, drug? The most data we have for that population is actually from melanoma group because they have been using um, those drugs for longer than us. Um, there was a retrospective analysis of 119 patients with melanoma who were treated with PD-1 inhibitors, and within that 119 patients, there was a 52 patients who had a pre-existing autoimmune disorders. And they saw that overall, 38% of the patients had a flare of autoimmune disorders, and the risk of the flare depends, you know, logically enough, um, if your patient had an active autoimmune disorders um, when you were starting um, immunotherapy. So if your patient had an active autoimmune disorder, there is a 60% chance of that autoimmune disorder getting worse. But if your patient had a history of autoimmune disorder or controlled autoimmune disorder, the chances of them having autoimmune toxicity would drop down to 20. Another good news is that majority of those um, immune-related toxicities in the patients with autoimmune disorders were as easily managed as if they would have developed in a patient without pre-existing autoimmune condition. So how do you manage them? So now you start the patient on immunotherapy, and now your patient is calling you complaining of some 
uh, symptoms. So the data that we have right now stems from how we run clinical trials. And we run clinical trials using CTAA, grading toxicity. And I do not really expect you to remember what grade three diarrhea is and how many bowel movements that counts because I don't remember that. And I, and I treat patients on a trial all the time. There are resources that you can go in and you can grade your patient's adverse event. But there are certain rules um, and you manage adverse events the same way regardless of where those adverse events coming from with a couple of key exceptions we shall go through later. For example, if your patient has a grade one immune-related adverse event, you start supportive therapy, antidiarrheal medications, skin creams, hydration, electrolytes. You have to educate the patient that this is what I'm concerned about. It might get worse, so be on the lookout for those symptoms A, B, and C. Um, in some situations, for example, if it's a diarrhea, you want to make sure that you exclude the infection, and it's education, 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 and you do not let that patient go for three weeks without talking to them. So if the patient already have the um, side effects which you think are immune-related, it is important to make sure that you stay on top of the monitoring of those symptoms very closely. So if your patient presents with grade two immune-related adverse events, you do the same thing as in grade one, so supportive care, but you hold the drug. So for grade one, you can continue the drug and do supportive care. For grade two, you hold the drug until the symptoms resolve to grade two. And as you're holding the drug, you're also monitoring your patient. So if you're holding a drug for a week and your patient's still having adverse events, this could be a signal that maybe it's time for you to start steroids. And for grade two toxicity, I would start steroids on a very low dose at 0.5 mix per kg. And then if your symptoms have resolved, I would be comfortable rechallenging those patients with immunotherapy um, if they had a grade two toxicity. So for the grade three toxicity, again, the same thing as for grade two, you initiate supportive therapy, you hold immunotherapy, but you don't wait for a week before you start steroids. You start steroids right away, the dose is higher, one to two mix per keg, and then you also watch the patient. If your patient did not improve your grade three toxicity in about, some, some people say two to three days, then you should start thinking about other drugs, uh, like, like, such as infliximab. Um, and mycophenolate. Um, if your symptoms resolve the grade one, then you have to slowly, and the key here is slowly taper the steroids. And as you taper in the steroids, do not forget about PCP prophylaxis and in some cases antifungal prophylaxis because your patient can develop those complications. Rechallenging upon um, resolution of grade three toxicity is, um, can be done. Um, it's on an individual basis and you know I would, depends on how bad your grade three was and how difficult was it to control. I could consider a challenge um, with immunotherapy after grade three toxicity. The one th thing to remember, there are no dose reductions for immunotherapy. It's either you're going with that or you're not going with that. Don't, don't reduce, don't change the schedule because then the, the activity is most likely gonna be less. So for the grade four is the same as grade three, but I would not recommend rechallenging. So you control the immune-related adverse events, but I would not rechallenge the patient after resolution. So what, when we started using, again, when I started prescribing my first PD-1 inhibitors, um, the one thing that goes through my mind, so if I'm giving those patients steroids, am I making immunotherapy less effective? So my initial thought was hold off the steroids because I wanna take care of the patient cancer. We now have data that treat, treating immune-related adverse events with steroids does not seem to affect the efficacy. And the data that I showed there, um, it's a data from ipilimumab, looking at 294 patients, and they so there is no outcome difference for patients requiring corticosteroids to treat immune-related adverse events and patients who did not. And we have um, similar data with nivolumab um, looking at almost 600 patients confirming a similar response rate in patients who required steroids treatments or did not require. So I would have low, not really low threshold, but low fear. So if the patient needs steroids, they need steroids. And again, the data so far showing that that does not change the efficacy of immunotherapy. So now we're gonna go through a certain key points um, specifically related to each immunotherapy toxicity that you can see. So colitis, um, I'm not gonna go through the clinical presentations. The, the, the key pearl in colitis, 
if your patient develop bulk perforation, despite whatever you did to them, you have to start stop steroids and you were giving them infliximab, you have to stop infliximab because that can increase the risk of infectious complications from that colitis and of course perforations you have to manage surgically. If you have a patient with autoimmune hepatitis, uh, the data is that you might want to start mycophenolate earlier and you do not give infliximab because of the increased hepatic toxicity with infliximab. When your patient is in immunotherapy and you're working out the hepatic toxicity, do not forget about viral reactivation. So we have a very high prevalence of chronic viral, viral hepatitis in this country, and immunotherapy in certain cases has been shown to uh, be able to reactivate hepatitis B. So just make sure that you look at that possibility as well. Another common question that I get um, you know, from my community partners is if I have a patient who I'm given immunotherapy and my amylase and lipase is going up, what do you do? The answer is nothing. Um, you just talk to the patient, make sure that they do not have symptoms of acute pancreatitis. So if your patient is not having abdominal pain, they're not throwing up and they're eating normally, and you just see an elevation of amylase and lipase, you could continue the, the medicine. Just again, watch carefully, talk to the patient, make sure that the patient is aware of what are the symptoms of pancreatitis. Um, rash, so rash is common. Uh, majority of the patients who have rash, they have a macular rash, but I cannot stress enough that exam is important. Because if you start seeing blistering rash, then you kind of start thinking about 10 or Stevens-Johnson syndrome, and then that might um, push me to start um, steroids sooner and definitely will push me to, to have the patient see a dermatologist. Usually the way you manage the rash, you can do topical steroids and antihistamines, but if it's a grade three and four rash, then I would recommend high dose steroids. Endocrinopathy, um, common, um, my personal experience that I actually see more hypothyroidism that was reported in the literature. But again, this is a very simple thing to manage as long as you're aware and as long as you're checking the thyroid functions. Hypophysitis, haven't seen one yet, but the clinical presentation is so um, unusual that I think it's very easy for a physician to miss the hypophysitis. The patient usually will present with headache, fatigue, weakness, maybe memory loss. They could have visual field disturbances because hypophysis is right next to the or optic chiasm. Um, and the mechanism of hypophysitis is because of the immune infiltration uh, by lymphocytes. Um, hypophysitis can be um, diagnosed by MRI. However, 25% of the patients will have normal pituitary MRI. And the way you diagnose hypophysitis, you basically do a full endocrine panel, including ACTG, LH, FSH, TSH, and T4. And usually you would just, um, you, you could give them um, hormone replacement. I would prefer to come manage hypophysitis together with my endocrinology uh, colleagues. Unfortunately, this is usually irreversible, and your patient might require long-term hormone therapy. Pneumonitis, um, luckily for us, is not as frequent. Um, it's about 5% in patients with PD-1 and PD-L1 therapy. Um, I showed you on the right side of the slide the grading um, for the pneumonitis, and you can see the majority of the patients with pneumonitis have a low grade. Um, majority of them are easily reversible with steroid therapy, and patients can be rechallenged after the pneumonitis, but you have to expect a, a high recurrence rate, which in the literature has been reported to be approximately 17%. Um, one pearl here is just what I see when, you know, chest x-rays. When I have my patients presenting to the emergency room complaining of shortness of breath somehow, and even though the notes from the emergency room physician says, I'm concerned of immunotherapy-related pneumonitis, chest x-ray gets ordered. So chest x-ray is not going to show you pneumonitis. If you're thinking about pneumonitis, go ahead and order the CT scan. There have been five uh, subtypes of pneumonitis uh, described radiographically, so it's not a typical ground glass opacity. Sometimes it would be can be a little bit more of interstitial disease or kind of um, um, in almost like infiltrative pattern for the pneumonitis. Neurological toxicities, um, cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome, um, uh, transverse myelitis have been reported in with those uh, drugs. They're usually rare. Uh, myasthenia gravis syndrome has also been reported in those patients. Less common adverse events, but nevertheless important for us to be aware, um, hemolytic anemia, ITPs, um, even acquired hemophilia A has been described as immunotherapy. We all know about recent publications in the Journal of Medicine. Um, ocular um, symptoms have been described, such as aritis, scleritis, uveitis. 
Um, so on treatment management, so what do you do? How do you stay on top of the patient's symptoms and what kind of uh, blood work are you recommended to be drawn? So for the patients who are on therapy, it is recommended to do thyroid function tests, CBC and LFTs at each treatment and every six weeks for six months after your patient came off the drug. Um, the other ACTG and cortisol should be checked in the patients who you suspect hypophysitis or suspect um, adrenal insufficiency. Um, and then frequency of the follow-up and the frequency of the testing should be um, uh, adjust adjusted to individual response and AE that occur. So education, education, education. So um, when we started using um, immunotherapy in, in UCSD, we actually felt that the person who we need to educate most was not us, was not our nurses, was emergency room physicians. So uh, we use EPIC as electronic medical record and on our patients receiving immunotherapy, we actually have a banner on the top saying, be aware of these patients in immunotherapy because the, the way you work up with the questions that you ask to those patients for the providers who is not as you know, familiar with immunotherapy as a, as a drugs, it is important for them to, to know um, that this patient is receiving immunotherapy. So resources, um, package inserts of all the drugs um, have uh, guidance and tables on how to manage that. Um, the, I like the Yervoy uh, package insert. I think it's very clear. Um, after reviewing the paper, this is my favorite articles. Um, it's very well written. It's mostly for the um, basic level, great for mid-levels, um, great for the nurses as well. Um, describes the immunotherapy-related toxicity and what to do with it. So in summary, um, as we learned today, immunotherapy compounds have unique toxicity profile. Providers need to be um, aware and needs to be proactive in managing that. And I put at the end uh, what you wanna do with a different grade toxicity and don't forget resources are available for you on the net. Um, if you forgot what to do with grade three diarrhea, you can easily look it up. That's it.